Hello, Algebra 2 trig students. Welcome back. We are on uh, lesson two of unit three, polynomial functions. And our focus today will be on graphing and creating polynomial functions. So we're going to graph a polynomial function, and we should be able to look at a graph of a polynomial function and create the actual equation. You can do your little warm up. Maybe you want to pause and see how you did. So go ahead and pause. Okay, how'd you do? Writing in descending order. Remember, from you go from highest degree to lowest. So you should have restructured this to become negative 4x cubed plus 3x squared minus 2x plus 5 equals p of x. Therefore, we look at the highest power, which is 3, so it has a degree of 3. The leading coefficient is negative 4 because it's the coefficient in front of the highest power. And then our end behavior. So your end behavior is as x goes to infinity, what is p of x going to do? Or what will the y value go to? Or as x goes to negative infinity, what is the y value going to approach? So I just took this leading coefficient and the first term, and I plug in a negative infinity. If I plug in a really huge negative number and I cube it, well, a negative times a negative times a negative is negative, and I multiply that by a negative 4, that's going to turn into a huge positive number because four negatives multiplied together become a positive. Here, if I have a positive huge number and I cube it, it's going to be a positive huge number even bigger than what it started with. And then I'm going to multiply it by a negative 4, so it's going to turn into a negative huge number. So, oops, I reversed those, sorry. As x goes to positive infinity, that's the green one, it should go toward negative infinity. And as x goes toward negative infinity, it's going to go toward positive infinity. Sorry about that, I swapped them. All right, so now we're going to talk about some graphs. So the next thing we do is the multiplicity of a root in a polynomial function. So what do we mean when we say the word multiplicity of a root? So it says every root has a multiplicity, which refers to the number of times that its associated factor appears in the polynomial. For example, if we have a function f of x and we take x minus 5 and we square it, and multiply that by x plus 3, then x equals 5 is going to be a double root because it has a multiplicity of 2. So it has a multiplicity of 2. It appears twice. Therefore, we now call 5 a double root. And you'll just see us do stuff like dr. And then negative 3 is to the first power. So that doesn't have more than one value of negative 3, so that's just a single root, right? So we have a double root. It has a multiplicity of 2 because that factor is raised to the second power. And then we have a single root. It's just a multiplicity of 1. Now, we have two very important things you must remember, especially when we're thinking about things graphically here, when we're thinking about the polynomial function graphically. The first one is if the root has an odd multiplicity, so it's to the first power or the third power or the fifth power, that's an odd multiplicity, then it will cross the x-axis at that root. So x equals negative 3 had an odd multiplicity, it's raised to the first power, so your graph would cross the x-axis at negative 3, right? So it's going to cross here. If it has an even multiplicity, the graph will bounce off. It will not cross the x-axis. Instead, it bounces away. So negative, or sorry, positive 5 has a even multiplicity, and so it's going to bounce away there. So we'll talk more specifically about why I know the graph looks like this, but it's going to be in 2 something squared to the first power. It's going to be a cubic function. It's going to go through negative 3 because that was a single root. Then it's going to come down to the negative, or sorry, to the positive 5 and bounce away because it has an odd multiplicity, or sorry, an even multiplicity. This is a double root. At double roots, they bounce away. This is a single root. At single roots, they go through the x axis. So your graph for x minus 5, the quantity squared, times x plus 3 would look something like this. And again, we'll learn more about the details about how I know that as we continue through this lesson. So the next sentence is important. It says, as the multiplicity of a root increases, the graph flattens out more and more near that root. So this was a double root up here, so it just kind of bounces away. 
but if it's a single root, it just crosses through. If it's a double root, it bounces away, so it's a little bit flatter at that root. If it's a triple root, triple root, it crosses through at that root, right? So these are all x equal one. This is a double root, this is x equal um, one, but it's a triple root, so it has a multiplicity of three. This is x equals one, it's a quad, uh, quartic root, quadruple root, and so as it goes through, it flattens out. So here it comes down, flattens out, and goes up, but it bounces away because it's a multiplicity of four, which is an even multiplicity, so it bounces off the x-axis. An odd multiplicity crosses through the x-axis, but again, the higher the multiplicity, the more that the graph flattens out at that particular root. So here an example, we could just have f of x equals, you know, some kind of slope um, minus 1, x-axis goes through. Here we could just have it as x minus 1, the quantity squared. Here it could be x minus 1, the quantity cubed. And here this could be x minus 1, the quantity to the fourth power. So it might look something like that. And these are possible equations of these functions, not the actual ones, right? This is just a possibility. Okay, we have a little revisit of end behavior of polynomial functions. So remember, end behavior is describing what's happening to the very far left of the x-axis or as x approaches negative infinity or to the very far right of the x-axis or as x approaches positive infinity. Or you could say as x's get very, very large, that's here, or x's get very, very small, right? So just as x goes to the right or as x approaches infinity, what's happening? So we have odd degreed functions. We have functions that have an odd degree or even degree. That was mis that was a typo, so make sure you're changing that um, on your notes. So what if we have a positive leading coefficient with an odd degree? So that would be like an example of a positive leading coefficient like three, an odd degree of like three x cubed. Of course, we would have to potentially have our x squared and x values, but I'm just gonna leave it as a leading coefficient of three, right? So we have a leading coefficient of three, positive leading coefficient, and then a degree, odd degree. So that's an odd degree of three. So if I were to graph that, well, if it's a positive leading coefficient with a odd degree, odd degrees have opposite end behaviors. If it's a positive leading coefficient, I want to end by walking uphill. Um, I'm going to start by walking uphill, except it's really going to point downward. So as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity, and as x goes to positive infinity, y goes to positive infinity, and my graph or my cubic would potentially look something like this, where I would have a maximum of three zeros on my x-axis. If I have an odd degree with a negative leading coefficient, then I'm walking downhill at the beginning and downhill at the end. So my end behaviors would look something like that. As x goes to positive infinity, y goes to negative infinity this time. And as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity this time. Again, if I did an example like a cubic, but I have a negative leading coefficient. This time it's negative leading coefficient, but still an odd degree. Well, if I put a cubic, it's still gonna cross through a maximum of three times, so it might look something like this. An even degree function has end behaviors that end in the same direction. They either both go up or both go down. So if it's a positive leading coefficient, think positive, positive, well, that's the up, up. If it's a negative leading coefficient, it's down, down. Now, whatever your even degree is, if your even degree was, you know, x to the fourth power, if I had a positive leading coefficient, of course, we could keep adding on to that. But that means it would cross through my x-axis a minimum or a maximum of four times. And then, of course, my end behaviors are both going to positive infinity. If I have a negative leading coefficient, well, negative is down, right? So my end behaviors are negative, going to negative infinity. So as x goes to infinity or negative infinity, y's go to negative infinity. Then if I did a negative leading coefficient, positive, or sorry, an even exponent, 
then it may look something like this with, if it's to the fourth power, we could potentially have four zeros. So there's your little revisit of end behavior. Now it's your turn to just sketch and do some of these graphs on your own, see how you do. Um, I wouldn't really worry about the leading coefficient. We're just trying to figure out what graphs would look like. So let me take you through a few and then you can kind of experiment. Um, we're just doing quick sketches to try to get our heads around what up these different polynomial functions, what options we could have. So if we have a linear function, you could draw so many different pictures, but there's a one real root. So here is my one real root. It's only going to cross the x-axis at one place. That's the maximum it can cross the x-axis, right? So this is the maximum number of times it can cross the x-axis. For a quadratic, the maximum number of times you can cross the x-axis is two, right? We can have two single real roots. However, it doesn't have to cross it twice. It could bounce away. So it could just hit it and be a double root, right? So it's bouncing away. Or we could have imaginary roots. It never crosses the x-axis because the vertex is above the x-axis and it opens upward. Or you could have a vertex below the x-axis and opens downward, right? So all of these parabolas could be opening up or they could be opening down. It doesn't really matter. I'm trying to sketch what the description is here. So this one has two single roots here and here. This has one real double root. And then this is an example of two imaginary roots. So a cubic, if we wanted to have three single roots, it would be one, two, three. So one single root, one single root, one single root. They all went through the x-axis. Okay, how about the next one? We're gonna have a single root and then a double root. So I went through the x-axis and then I bounced off of the x-axis, or I hit the x-axis and bounced away. I just bounce off. Okay, what about the third example? We want one triple root. Remember if you flip back to the beginning of the notes, the higher the multiplicity, so this has a multiplicity of three because it's a triple root, the flatter it gets. So it's just going to come through, flatten out. So wherever that value is, where it's a triple root at that point, because it's flattening out, but it's never really changing from increasing to decreasing. It's just going up, 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 up. It's just flattening out at the root. All right, how about this next one? One real, two imaginary. So it only crosses the x-axis one time, but here is where your imaginary roots are gonna be, somewhere in there. All right, I want you to continue this next page on your own. So try, now that I've done the um, first couple of examples, I want you to pause here and just try them on your own. See how you do. There's infinite amount of pictures you could have, but you just wanna see if you have the four single roots or two single, one double, two double. So you're just trying to understand what is a single root, what is a double root, what are imaginary roots, what are real roots, what's a quadruple root. So just pause and try that on your own. All right, have a look. You should have an idea. Here are some pos potential answers, right? We have four single roots, crosses the axis four times. Two single, one double, crosses through, bounces away, bounces off, bounces off because it's two double. One quadruple just means it's super flat at that one singular root. Here we have two imaginary and two single. So here's a single, here's a single, and then my imaginaries are up here somewhere. I have a one um, real double and two imaginary. So here's my double because it bounces away and then you could put it, of course, obviously you know you could have the opposite um, end behaviors. It could be going up, up, or down, down. Doesn't really matter. Four imaginary roots means it's never gonna cross the x-axis. We could have the W or the M shape, or it could just be one big wide looking something like this, but never crossing or touching the x-axis. So nice, ask your teacher questions if you're confused, um, but this is just try to get your head around single roots, double roots, imaginary roots, real roots, quadruple roots, etc. 
All right, so let's jump into some examples now. Now we're going to practice looking at an equation and sketching the graph. Um, so let's look at example one. It says sketch the graph of g of x, given that it equals 1 half times the quantity of x plus 4 times x plus 1 times x minus 2. You have to do this. Label the x and y intercepts. So first of all, hopefully you're looking at this in intercept form, and you're saying, great, my x-intercepts are negative 4, negative 1, and 2. So we're sketching, so I just do a quick approximation on the x-axis. There are my zeros at negative 4, negative 1, and 2. The next thing you want to do is find the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is when x is 0. So I need to plug in 0 for x. So what will the y-intercept be if I plug in 0 for x? So 0 plus 4 is 4, so you may not need to show all this work. You may just be doing this in your head, right? 1 times 4 times negative 2. Well, 4 times 1 times negative 2 is negative 8. 1 half times negative 8 is negative 4. So my y-intercept is negative 4. Okay. So we kind of have an idea of what it needs to do, but really I, what I don't know and what you need to make sure you're checking on is the end behavior, right? What's happening as x goes to positive infinity and what is happening as x goes to negative infinity? So what do I have here? I have x, if I were gonna expand this, I would have x times x times x, and then I have my leading coefficient of 1 half. So my first, term with the highest degree is going to be 1 half x cubed. This is an odd function with a leading coefficient that is positive. So if you go back and you look, an odd function and the leading coefficient is positive, well I want to see, think to myself, okay what happens if I put in a positive number for x, then I'm going to cube it and multiply by a positive so it's going to end being positive my y value will be positive. If I put a negative value in for x, a negative cubed is negative, and negative times 1 half is negative. So it's going to end, as x goes to negative infinity, my y value is going down to negative infinity. So now I just have to put it all together. These are all three single roots, right? They have a multiplicity of 1. So I have to go through the x-axis through the x-axis, hit my y-intercept, through the x-axis, and there is a sketch of my graph. It's not perfect. You know, we have no idea how high up this value is going to go right here, and that's okay. That's why we're sketching it. I didn't ask for this value. I don't have a grid. I'm not making you write a specific value there, right? It's just a sketch. So what do we have to have on our sketch? We have to have our x-intercepts of negative 4, negative 1, and 2, and we need to have our y-intercept of negative 4. Okay, try the second one on your own. Just go ahead and pause and try example 2.
2 times negative 1. Well, 25 times 2 is 50. 50 times negative 1 is negative 50. So I divide each side by negative 50. So A is actually equal to 5. So my last step is to actually identify the equation or the function for that graph. And this would be the exact equation for the graph, this particular graph here, because it had the point 3, negative 250 on the black graph. All right, try this one. If you want to pause and try it on your own, please do, or I'll just take you through it. But give it a go on your own if you can first, um, but you don't have to. Okay, so what do I see with this function? I see only two zeros. I see a zero at negative four, and I have a C a zero at one. But notice that this negative four, it's flattening out. And so when it's flattening out, but actually going through the graph, it needs to be a bigger multiplicity than just one. So that has a multiplicity of three, or in other words, at negative four, that's a triple root. So I'm gonna build my function I don't know what the leading coefficient or the a value is, what that dilation is, and I'm always going to write these equations in intercept form. So I have a 0 at negative 4, so I'm going to change that to positive 4. It's flattening out there, so that means it's a triple root, which means it has a multiplicity of 3. So that is why I have taken it to the third power. I have another 0 of 1. So I'm going to multiply this times x minus 1. It is just to the, sink, to the um, first power, so you don't even need to put that one there if you don't want to, um, because it just goes straight through the graph. I don't have any other zeros, so this is it. So the last thing I do is take the point that it goes through. It says it goes through negative 1, <clears throat> 162. Or sorry, negative 162. So when the y value is negative 162, the x value is going to be negative 1. So I'm plugging negative 1 in for my x value, and now I'm just going to calculate. So negative 162 equals a times, well, negative 1 plus 4 is 3. 3 cubed is 27. 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. Negative 1 times, or sorry, Negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. 27 times negative 2 is negative 54. So I'm going to divide each side by negative 54. And then I'm going to divide that. And so that is just going to equal 3. Negative times negative, or sorry, negative divided by negative is positive. So that ends up being positive 3. So my final function is... 3 times x plus 4, the quantity cubed, times x minus 1. Now, stop and ask yourself, does this make sense? My leading coefficient is positive. I have x to the third power times x to the one power. That would give me x to the fourth power with the positive leading coefficient. Is my end behavior such that that makes sense? Yes. It's an even degree, which means your end behaviors are the same. They're both up or both down. And my positive leading coefficient means that they're both going to be up. So yes, this makes sense. Um, that is my final answer. So now this one, you should definitely pause and try this on your own. I'm going to do the same thing. Um, and apologies, this says leave your final answer in standard form. We're never going to have you do that. So always leave your answer in intercept form. I'm not a fan of standard form. Do not worry about that. Just leave it in intercept form. We will never have you expand. Okay, go for it. Okay, last example. If you left it in intercept form, did you get, you could either put f of x equals negative 1 times x plus 4 times x plus 3 times x minus 1, or you don't really need to actually put the 1. You can just put a negative sign in front of those three parentheses. So how did I do it? I first got the three single roots. I listed them. Then I use this information. When I plugged in negative 1 for x, I would get a positive 12 for y. And so I did all, sorry, sorry, did all the math to figure out that uh, a is equal to negative 1. So that's it.
practice. There's lots of homework questions to practice, lots of practice in there. You might want to do just the evens or the odds um, to see if you're understanding it and then save the rest for another day, like the day before the quiz or some other time to review. All right, ask your teacher if you have questions. Bye. To figure out